speaking of disguises, maybe uh, redirecting attention, uh, there was the death of Alexei Navalny, the <laughs> uh, longtime opposition figure, uh, longtime discredited opposition figure. Yeah. It's important to to say this, uh, but he died not too uh, long after Avdiyevka fell. Um, and uh, there was, of course, a firestorm, of course, in the mainstream media. Oh, yeah. uh, the entire mainstream Western media was all in with Navalny. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to get your take on this because uh, it's been known, even in Western mainstream media, even Amnesty International had to take away their identification of Navalny as a prisoner of conscience in 2021 because of his very vile, nasty, and outright dehumanizing and racist remarks about all of the uh, ethnic groups in Russia that practice Islam. But nonetheless, uh, it felt very convenient that his death, as it took place, helped redirect so many. And now we have talks of sanctions on Russia, <laughs> even sanctions on China for supporting Russia, but sanctions on Russia for what it did to Navalny. Um, whoever wants to begin, maybe Scott, you can begin. Your reaction. Well, I wrote to... excellent expose today. Yeah, I think you were recently. Oh, watched yeah, the article he, excellent. I read it like, oh, yeah, I refreshed it. Beautiful. <laughs> Well, I think we just have to acknowledge it. First of all, we, we, we have to be careful about using the term opposition. Um, you know, the, 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 the political opposition to Vladimir Putin is the Communist Party. They get, what, they pull in 17, 20% every election. Um, you know, real numbers, they're not, they're not going to defeat him, but those are real numbers. Navalny, at best, would get 2 to 5%, at best. Um, you know, there was a time in, I think, 2018 when he uh, got involved in Moscow politics, uh, but that was a unique situation. He pulled in 27 percent uh, for Moscow, but he got beat. Um, but the, the big problem with Navalny is that he's not um, legitimate opposition. Now, opposition is somebody that is Russian who uh, talks to Russians, the communists. Again, I'm not pro-communist, but I'm just saying that's as Russian as you get, guys. It's a Russian Communist Party. They have organizations in every city and village that are remnants of the Soviet times. And when they meet, they talk about what they believe is good for Russia. And, and this is the important part. What's good for Russia? Which means that there can be uh, agreement with Putin or disagreement with Putin. But they're not going to undermine Russia. Navalny was never about what's good for Russia. Navalny was about getting rid of Vladimir Putin. He was involved in four um, uh, regime change or, or election altering uh, activities. The first was 2007, 2008 uh, during the swap. If you remember the swap between Putin and uh, and um, in Medvedev, uh, Putin was president, served his constitutional two terms, had to step aside. Medvedev was prime minister. Um, what Putin said is, this is what we're going to do because Putin calls the shots. He says, <laughs> United, United Russia, the party is going to win the, the parliamentary elections. I will then say I'll be prime minister. You then, now backed by United Russia, will run for president. You will become president. You will appoint me prime minister. Four years later, we're going to flip roles and I'll go back to being president. Um, and the reason is, what people don't understand, this isn't about Putin being a dictator for life. This is about Putin recognizing the problems that faced Russia. Russia was a destroyed nation in the 1990s, which collapsed. They called it the catastrophe for a reason. Putin's job was to bring Russia out of this. 2007 was only seven years after the disaster. Five years, I mean, only two years after the end of the, of the Chechen conflict. Corruption is still rampant. Um, you know, and Putin knows that, but Putin knows that you can't change things overnight. It takes time. You have to grad, you have to work at all the governor uh, at all the regions. You have to get things working. You can't stamp out corruption if the economy doesn't function. So 
you have to tolerate a certain amount of corruption until you get an economy functioning. Once you get an economy functioning, you have taxes flowing in that can pay pensions and do infrastructure. Then you can do things like, let's start tightening the rule of law. Let's start tight and getting, getting that in there and we'll get corruption out and we'll do that. But if you start right off the bat with get rid of corruption and you pull the oligarchs who are the only people with any economic sense at that point in time out of it, the economy will collapse. It's, it's as simple as it gets. So Putin has taken the long, slow approach and he says, we're not ready yet. We're not ready for me to step aside uh, because another reason why is who's going to replace me? Well, the CIA, the State Department, the British intelligence have been trying to create an opposition to replace him. And in 2007, they tried to do a color revolution. Navalny was part of this. He was part of this youth mobilization group that was supposed to replicate what happened in Ukraine in the Orange Revolution, and it failed. Um, Navalny then went into, you know, his, his, his you know, uh, I guess they call it shareholder activism phase where he's exposing corruption. Um, and then he gets tapped to go to Yale. And this is where my article ends up. This because uh, part two is coming. Yale, let me just tell you what it was. It was a CIA grooming and uh, training operation. He went there. There's a guy in his class who is a former intelligence guy who is the spotter who arranges it. Navalny gets in with the Americans. He, he you know, one of the uh, things he did while he's at Yale, this, this, this cultural thing and all that. He starts his attack. He's in Yale in November of 2010 when he starts releasing documents about corruption of uh, Transneft, I think it was called, uh, a, a big thing. And then, and then when he came back in December, he started to pile on. This was a targeted operation by the United States to use Navalny to destroy the credibility of Vladimir Putin in the lead up to the critical 2012 presidential election. They didn't want Putin to come back in. They were trying to destroy Putin's reputation so that Dmitry Medvedev would say, I have no choice but to remain president. It was a CIA operation from the get-go, and Navalny was a CIA asset. So that's why anybody who sits there and says he's a patriot, he's up. No, he is a controlled CIA asset who is a traitor to Russia. But the Russians, you know, first of all, you got to say Medvedev sort of a, Medvedev for a moment thought he was going to be, then he didn't want Putin. Medvedev was like, I like the idea of staying president. And Putin, meanwhile, as prime minister going, that ain't going to happen. But um, don't worry about it, Dmitry. You're not going to be president. But Dmitry was playing the game. So Dmitry actually facilitated Navalny's work, allowed it to happen, allowed it to go on. It wasn't until 2011 when Putin made the phone call and said, no, 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 that ain't going to happen that they started to tune the screws on Navalny. They knew that if they called him a CIA asset and all this kind of stuff, that 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 wasn't the way to take him down. The right way to take him down was through corruption. Here's Mr. Anti-Corruption, and suddenly they got the goods on him because back when he didn't make any money, before he went to Yale, he had to go to Kirov. And um, he was brought in there by the governor, who he knew as an opposition politician before. And the idea was to, to look at the economic efficiency of some industry. The one that was uh, Kirov Lios, which is the uh, forestry, the timber. Navalny comes in, meets with the director, and says, the problem is all your boys in your 36 lumber mills are cutting timber on the side, side contracts, and, and selling it for direct cash that's going in their pockets. It's not being reported to the company ledger, and you're losing money. This is why you look so bad. You're cutting trees, but you ain't making any money. The way you're going to make money is I'm going to bring my best friend here and he's going to set up an intermediary and he's a, you know, a trading company and you're going to give him lumber at a good market rate and then he's going to sell it. We get a 7% commission, but then that money that we make goes on your ledgers and you make money. And the, and the guy's going, uh, but I guess you're from the governor. So, okay, if that's what the governor wants. Well, it was a money-making scheme for Navalny because they were getting the timber at very low prices, and then they'd go out there and sell them at high prices, pocket the, not only the difference, but the 7% commission. And th that money wasn't going in. They were still losing money. Navalny and his buddy were making money. Uh, this place. And then here's the kicker. Navalny does all this, and then in July, the governor says, run an audit on them. So Navalny runs the audit. They fail the audit. And the manager is fired for mismanagement. 
and all that. And then Navalny closes his trading company and returns to Moscow with a whole bunch of money in his pocket. He's a corrupt mother, you know what? But, you know, everybody in Russia was. I'm just saying, telling you, the only way you lived in Russia at that time was to have little schemes going on like that because they weren't ready for the real deal. This is what Putin recognized. We have work to do. So now the Russians turn the screws on this and now he becomes a corrupt guy. And that was the beginning and the end of him because the Russians, again, were just basically saying, you're, you're not going to get to play the CIA game. But Navalny, the CIA owned him. So he kept trying to play the game. He tried to disrupt the – where they really cut him down was the 2021 um, constitutional reforms. The CIA told him to disrupt that, again, to attack Putin, to bring down the constitutional reforms because this would allow Putin now to extend the stay. Uh, he wouldn't have to leave. He could do two more six-year terms, give him 12 years. And the United States is going, we don't want 12 more years of Putin. He has to go. Navalny, it's your job. But he couldn't do it. Uh, he was he was arrested. He was given parole, probation. The Russians were sort of being nice to him. And then the whole Novichik thing comes up. And I'll talk about that. But let me just put it this way. The German medical records show that there was no Novichuk involved. It's a, it's a manufactured thing. What probably happened most likely is that <coughs> Navalny deliberately overdosed on antidepressants uh, to create a physical collapse that then could get him together with British intelligence, German intelligence, and American intelligence out of Russia, which they successfully pulled off. Then he has a miraculous recovery because Novichuk, of course, is the most deadly substance known to man. Uh, even a whiff of it kills a million people. But nope, Navalny miraculously survived. In December, he ends up in the Black Forest at a CIA-run documentary uh, film production company where they produced two documentaries in the span of a month. Now, Danny and Andre, I've made documentary films. I made one back about weapons of mass destruction. I'm making one right now. Uh, you can't make a documentary film in a month. I'm just telling you right now, especially when you bring in sophisticated computer-generated graphics and all this kind of stuff. The CIA already had it all packaged up. They had a whole support thing going in. They produced these movies. Now, how do, these movies were designed to destroy the credibility of Vladimir Putin. But now, how do you do that? Well, what you have to do is the guy who made the movie is going to go back to Russia. And everybody's saying, but you're going to get arrested. Yes. I'm going to get arrested, but then you're going to release the movie. Putin's going to be discredited. It's going to destroy him. He's going to be swept out of power, and I will be released, and I will be the hero. I will be the next president of Russia. Two movies. One was Putin's Palace, which was the total fabrication about something. It fell apart immediately. It's really bad work by the CIA. The second one was Navalny, which ended up winning an Academy Award. Um, you know, yay. But the problem is Navalny went back, and the Russians went, we, we're sort of being nice to you but we're no longer going to be nice to you. You're going to jail. Not only are you going to jail, we're going to pile on this another corruption thing because you're a corrupt guy. We know it. Boom. Extremism. Boom. And a two-year suspended sentence turned into a 30-year life sentence in prison. And he's done. He's not getting out. Now, then, then what happens? This is the thing. And I don't know. There's a lot of speculation, but... Um, let me, let me put it this way. His death was not coincidental. The West was too, too front-loaded on this one. You had the boyfriend of Navalny uh, four days prior saying, you know, that we need a, we need a game-changing event coming out of prison in order for this to work. Well, game-changing thing, he's dead. His lawyer met with him two days before and gave him medicine. And then Navalny drops dead. So I call it my uh, Frankie five angels moment godfather two near the end of the movie special five angels. intel services special yeah. services all this operate uh within the realms of the organized crime and lawyers who work for it it's it's classics you know it's a modus operandi of the uh, intelligence services you don't have to have any serious uh, intelligence even a uh, background like scott does to understand that how do you uh, proceed you know when you want to subvert or recruit somebody well guess what uh, organized crime is the best way and um, believe me even with the much more improved uh system of the control of the criminality in Russia and obviously of the penitentiary system. Guess what? They still, uh, you know, communicate between each other. 
There are certainly corrupt uh, guards in there. There are certainly communications with the outside world. So it's not that difficult to, you know, kill the guy by different means. In the end, there is all this while he was in the, well, um, he wasn't really, he was in general colony, what it's called. So, yeah, there's always could be set up something, some people who are very, you know, what they know that they are pretty much for the life, for life sentence. They might just, you know, shank him and that's it, you know. But here it was probably some chemical in the wall and voila, there you go. So it's not that difficult, especially for the figure of such public profile in the West. In Russia, he is not taken seriously. And uh, so they did. That's what the only thing they can do to remove any kind of the focus from the situation on the front, which is catastrophic for NATO. And many people begin to come out. And you know what? Uh, I um, listened to some of the former military, American military, who appear also on judges. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I understand. People have to. It's not easy for many people. It's excruciating. I understand that. I went through it myself. You see, that's the point. The only people who can understand what Americans are going through right now are Russians. There's no other people who can really relate to this. We've been through this in 90s, okay? And so that's sort of 90s which are happening in the United States, obviously with the uh, dramatically different specifics of the United States. But when you look at this and you see how... Uh, ineffective and how pathetic those attempts are. It's like, oh yeah, they killed Navalny. Wow, too freaking bad, you know? <laughs> so Russia doesn't care. And like, good riddance, you know? So, and they still do not understand. And I spoke about it in my last video yesterday. They still don't understand what Russia is. They don't understand what its history, how it is related. You go, for example, uh, as we did last year in August, uh, just you know, five months ago, you go through uh, Helsinki and you drive into St. Petersburg, okay? And you drive through the highway in St. Petersburg. And when there's on the right side of the uh, Gulf of Finland, you see this, it's magnificent. It's the tallest building in Europe. It's called Lachta Center. It's this, you know, just beautiful tower. And you have three flags there, gigantic banners on there. You know, one is the Imperial Russia, another Soviet Union, and another modern Russian tricolor. And they do not understand that what Putin achieved, many people do not even understand what has been achieved. He stitched together this Russian history as one unending process. And it's, you know, it's your history, period. Nothing you can do about it. You can go, you cannot go out and, you know, reject Soviet period. It affected so many people. So many, so much have been achieved there. There, you cannot go out and you know reject Peter the Great, you know, or Westernization of Russia. It's part of the history, and they still don't get it. You know, they still don't get. They still play with those things because, as I am on record, the field of Russian studies is dead in the United States. What it has been affected by the BS of the primarily dissidents. You know, who had the agenda they wanted to, and, and I all, always say, uh, and by the way, Scott, I mentioned you yesterday in my video when I was responding to some American officer about the World War II or Great Patriotic War in Soviet Union. Then I said, yeah, you, you, bec you either like Scott Ritter or Larry, you go to Russia, you talk to people, you begin to, you know, just, you know, what Scott writes essentially, you know, the war for peace, if you wish, you know. So that's how you make contacts, that's how you develop the, you know, so to speak, the environment. And then when the Navalny case comes in, it's like, okay, yeah, you know what, Candace Owens has bigger audience than CNN, okay? Let me put it this way, simple as that. And... Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about complete, uh, so to speak, the uh, paradigm shift in the in, uh, informational environment that, uh, as we spoke with you, uh, I believe, with you uh, about John Stewart. Not funny. Yeah. It's right before yeah, before the show. Yeah, right. for this, you know, uh, let him do his thing. His shtick life changed so much. 
and a special military operation obviously was this kind of you know the primer which lit up this uh, you know the uh, shell if you wish and uh we have what we have they try to push Navalny nobody cares yeah. And fact is, uh, uh, and there's nothing wrong with this. I'm pretty sure most Americans don't care about Ukraine either, you know. So they, yeah. many of them will not find it on the map. So it's like, you know, they played those games, you know, they fought. And uh, it is very uh, important that, for example, today, uh, former, uh, former uh, uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union, uh, uh, esteemed Jack Matlock, when there was real american diplomacy when you had people of stature you know you may go and discuss whatever you want about mr james baker but he is a smart guy okay he was a man of and then of course you have ambassador like jack matlock and he speaks today i don't remember what platform he was talking about how russians have been basically cheated you know so and russians have a long memory in when about the expansion of nato and Jack Matlock was present there. He was part of those negotiations. He uh, he was friend of George uh, Bush Senior. You know, James Baker. They were buddies essentially. You know, so he been through this when it was all arranged with Gorbachev and how it was basically. You know what? And Russians remember that, and that dictates all this situation, which overall the framework in which we all are today. Of course, with different views, different experiences, and things of this nature. But obviously, what, uh, for example, I admire what Scott does. You know, so well, pretty much half Russia admires what Scott, what Scott does. <laughs> so, and uh, this is so important. You know that uh, people talk about it and they bring it up to uh, public at large and educate it. You know, and that is why, yeah, CNN can write about Navalny whatever they want, or Wall Street Journal, or whatever, MSNBC, which is altogether, you know, a joke of a news outlet. It's not going to change the overall trend because we have forces, historical forces working of such a scale that I cannot even, I am finishing my fourth book right now, and sometimes I cannot find words to adequately, you know, uh, describe things because, like, Okay, if I describe this, where do I go from there? Because it is so huge in its massive geopolitical realignment, which we observe today, that uh, it's all started when they decided to, you know what, provoke Russia. And, you know, suddenly we have the world which we knew, it's not there anymore. Whatever mm -hmm. comes in, my gosh, I don't know, you know, brave new world. Different way, different version, though, though you know. <laughs> so that will be my uh, statement for today. You know, I will have to leave like in five minutes. So. Okay, <laughs> I'll just I'll just throw in two seconds worth here. Uh, Jack Matlock was the ambassador when I was a weapons inspector in uh, so Union, and I and I met him um, and 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 actually did a little bit of work with him. But I've read his book. He was kind enough to autograph uh, his book, um, Autopsy on an Empire. Um, which tells his time as ambassador, but you know Michael McFall has written a book too. Um, I forget the name of the title of it. And I've read both books. Um, Michael McFall writes about his experience as ambassador. I'll just give you the difference between the two in a nutshell. Matlock talks about going to the Bolshoi Theater. He talks about watching opera. He talks about going to museums. In addition to telling these wonderful stories about let me, what let, happened. Second, just give me a second. I will add. Jack Matlock speaks. Perfect Russian, Perfect and Russian. he knows Pushkin poetry such Inside way that Evgeny Onegin that most Russians don't know. He yeah. is absolute scholar. Uh, well, he 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 sent a message, and the Russians. Uh, I was sort of the middleman between his visit, you know, between the embassy and the in the Soviets for his visit, and the Soviets said, "What." When Matlock's here, what does he want to do? What does because he had never been to Udmurtia before. Nobody had. <laughs> and and they and, and Matlock came back and he said, Whatever, just show me something cultural, something about the history, whatever they want to share with me, I will I will devour. I want to learn about you, you know. And and they were just like, Wow, okay, and they did. Okay, McFall wrote this book and he tells all his little stories. Never once does he mention the Bolshoi theater. Never once does he mention the, the hermitage or culture. He could care less. You know, he was the guy, remember the reset, the famous button, you know, the red button and reset. 
Well, McFaul's the guy because he was the Russian expert at the National Security Council. And he said, they said, let's, let's reset. So he wrote down a word and he said, that's the reset. So they got on the little tape, the Cyrillic tape thing, put it in there. It didn't say reset. It said overcharged. They overload. Used the wrong word. Actually, overload. Overload, yeah. Lavrov was kind of like, what the hell is the that? hell you got me pushing here? <laughs> but this was, this was Michael McFaul because he's an idiot. He's a moron. He's a dirtball. He... And he hates Russia, hates Russia with his, with, with a passion because you can't claim to love Russia. Look, I'm a Marine. Andre, you know what I'm saying when I say I'm a Nikola Turnik, okay? I am a Mujik. I am as simple as it gets. All right. You put me in the ballet and you're going to get the, you know, head back <laughs> thing going on and all that. But I've been to the Bolshoi. I got to watch uh, Swan Lake at the Bolshoi. Classic, I was yeah. at the uh, at the Malinsky or the Mariinsky, Mariinsky Theater yeah. in uh, St. Peter's to watch uh, the nut the Nutcracker at Christmas time. Um, I've been to the Hermitage. I've been to the uh, to the museums because it's Russian culture, and you have to experience it. You have to see it. Um, McFall is supposed to be a Stanford professor. He's supposed to be this 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 mind. He doesn't care about that because he doesn't care about Russia because he doesn't know Russia. And you know what's interesting? The Russians love Jack Matlock. They may not agree with everything that Jack Matlock did. How can they? He's an American ambassador. He's he's doing what America wants. He's not there to serve Russia. Um, but they respect that because he respects them, because he knows them. He knows their culture. McFall is just an idiot. He doesn't know anything about Russia. He can't speak the language. And I don't fault him. I can't either. Anybody who saw me speak before oh, the judge... No, I can't speak. It. Believe me, <laughs> but, uh, better than me. <laughs> but, but at least I, but at least I try to appreciate Russian culture. I, I'm curious about it. Um, McFall has none of that curiosity, and that's the difference. Jack Matlock is loved because he, he loves Russia. McFall is despised because he despises Russia. Yeah, that's pretty much very great, uh, you know, uh, summary exactly about these two men. I actually shook Jack Matlock's hand in Seattle in 94, I believe. We have been on the some gathering uh, in uh, Seattle Sheraton conference room. Uh, there was a large conference. There were people like, you know, diplomats, all kinds of, you know, so. And Jack Matlock was spoke to our crowd. There was a lot of Russian business there too, you know. So and it was amazing actually. So yeah. I went in, I shook his hand, expressed my he doesn't remember me, obviously, but I was kind of like expressed admiration to him, you know. So and uh, I Did see you wash like, the hand yet? No. <laughs> 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 so but yeah, Jack Matlock is like when you look at uh, and you say, Okay, what is the standard of American diplomacy, which is not there anymore? Jack Matlock. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.